Well, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the Jewish Concepts of God class. This is the introduction and first class God in the Bible. This is actually a redo of the class I actually did. I didn't live stream the first one at the synagogue. So this is me at my house doing the class so it can be on the internet. So the introduction, what is this class about? Well, this class is about God. Um, it's the way that Jews have spoken about God over 4,000 years. Um, we won't tell you what to believe. What we're going to do is present, or what I'm going to do, is present a spectrum of theological options for you to choose from of what you believe God is, or maybe to help you figure out what God is. Everything is coming from this book, Finding God, 10 Jewish Responsive. There's responses, there's a new version out, called Finding God. I believe it's several Jewish responses. So you can get this book. It's a great book. So there are nine questions that are going to be answered during this class. Um, the first one is, what is God? It's got a spirit, a force, a person, a human invention. Um, number two, is there one God? Are there other divine powers? Do angels exist? Does Satan exist? Number three, what is God's name? Number four, how can we know God? Is, do we have personal knowledge of God? Is God totally beyond human understanding? Number five, what is God's relationship with the world? Did God create it? Does God intervene with the world still? Is God distant? Does God perform miracles? Number six, does God have a special relationship with the Jewish people? Number seven, what does God really want from us? Are we commanded to obey through, cer through um, certain acts? Number eight, how does God relate to me? Number nine, why is there evil in the world? That's nine, that's right, okay. Um, so that's what we're going to, the questions that will be posed to these different theologians. Um, this class will not provide definite answers. It'll present different opinions from different theologians. So most Jews don't really talk about God, especially in the Reform movement. Um, most have the Jewish God idea, which is theism, which is addressed in chapter 1 and chapter 2, God in the Bible and God in rabbinic literature. That's what most Jews are used to talking about. So I'm going to start with God in the Bible. So in ancient times, peoples of the Near East accepted without question the existence of divine beings. They didn't ask, does God exist? They asked, who is our God? What does our God expect? What is our God's name? So nowhere in the Hebrew Bible is there a passage trying to prove, prove that God exists. The existence of God was never questioned. It was just a given that God exists. So when God spoke to Moses through the bush, the burning bush in the Exodus story. Moses wanted to know God's name. Moses didn't say, hey, do you really exist? So Moses said to God, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, thus shall you speak to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So the biblical Israelites mostly asked, is the Lord present among us or not? They just wanted to know if God was distant or if God's power would save them from the enemies and provide for their needs. So the next section is called developing an idea of God. Who is this God that, that we worship? Well, in biblical times, ideas about God changed from time to time as the Israelites moved from place to place. Early on, most Israelites saw God as the sole protector of them, but didn't deny the, the existence of other deities for other peoples. The superiority of our God over others is expressed in the Michamocha prayer, Exodus 15.11. So who is like you, eternal one, among the gods that are worshipped? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? Um, there are certain natural forces worthy of worship by others, not by the Israelites, since God controlled everything, but the other cultures worshipped 
the forces of nature. And Deuteronomy 4, 19 to 20, we read, And when you look up to the sky and behold the sun and the moon and the stars, the whole heavenly host, you must not be lured into bowing down to them or serving them. These the Lord your God allotted to the other peoples as divinities everywhere under heaven, which you the Lord took to be his very own people. So scholars realized that the Canaanite religion had an influence on, on the biblical views of God. The Israelites borrowed these ideas. Um, so God is not only viewed as the creator, but like Baal or Baal, as a powerful deity, quote, riding upon the clouds, and, or end quote, and a provider of grain, wine, and oil. So over, the t over time, the belief of other gods faded away, and belief in anything else was considered idolatry. So around the 6th century BCE, um, was uh, written Isaiah, and it says this about other gods existing. While you are less than nothing, your effect is less than nullity. One who chooses you is an abomination. And also there is in Psalms 96, 5, all the gods of the peoples are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So there it shows that the other gods that are worshipped out there are nothing but idols and they're false and they don't mean anything to anybody. God is the only God to everyone. So there's a composite view of God. The Bible doesn't contain one concise notion of God. There are a few major beliefs that, that track throughout though. Um, and these are the culmination of various stages from 1800 BCE through the first third of the first century CE. When we say CE, we mean AD, BCE is BC. So the first thing, monotheism. There is only one God. That's what monotheism means, one deity, one God. God is one, the only one, no other gods. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Lahino, Adonai Echad. Hero Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Um, the Bible does refer to other deities, uh, angels, divine beings, the host of heaven, but they are only messengers. God doesn't belong to a divine group. God doesn't have a female counterpart. God doesn't have a wife, a father, a mother, a son, a daughter. God stands alone. That's what's throughout the Bible. God is God by himself. God has a name. This is the second thing. In the Bible, God is referred to as El, or Elohim, named God, El Shaddai, the Almighty, Adon, Lord, Sor, Rock, Av, Father, Melech, King. So these are not names, but titles. Just like if you have, know somebody named Sarah, Sarah can be my friend, my wife, my cousin. Those are not her names, those are her titles. Her name is Sarah. God does have a proper name, the Hebrew letters yud heh vav -Hey, but we do not know how to pronounce that because the pronunciation of that name was lost when the temple was destroyed. Number three, no one knows what God looks like. Um, there are no images of God, no idols of God were allowed to be made. In Exodus 24 to 5, we read, you shall not make for yourself a sculptured image of God. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Um, so, how did they imagine God? Was there a particular form that they thought about God? Um, we can read in Exodus 24, 11, that Moses and a few elders of Israel beheld God, and they ate and drank. No, it doesn't say exactly what they saw, just that they beheld God. Um, so some say that it might have referred to the platform that God stood on, because we read in Exodus 24.10, Under his feet there was the likeness of a pavement of sapphire, like the very sky of purity. So they can see what God, they describe what God is standing on, but they don't describe God, God's self. Um, Moses is only allowed to see the likeness of God. Um, Micah, in the Book of Kings, and Isaiah, quote, saw God, but there's no description of God that they saw. 
Ezekiel saw a blurred image of a semblance of a human form. Elijah met God in the, quote, still small voice of conscience. And the people of Israel heard God at Sinai, but they did not see God. So what does this infer? That God is incomparable in majesty and totally different from us. We can feel God, but we cannot see God. Number four, God acts in the world. Uh, we can recognize God's presence through the beauty of human nature and God's influence in history. How is this? A, as creator of the world. So the universe came into being through the divine, quote, word. Um, so we see in Psalms 33, 9, For he spoke, and it was, he commanded, and it endured. We will talk about the Logos, the word, during um, the portion on Philo, which I believe is chapter 3. Um, Israel's God acted alone, um, and the world is established in a predictable order. In Psalms we read, He made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun knows when to set. You bring on darkness, and it is night. Um, God's creation is renewed continually. In Psalm 135, he makes clouds rise from the end of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He releases the wind from his vaults. So humans were created and placed in an orderly environment. Of course, this is from the uh, God in the Bible, the biblical perspective. No individual... Oh, we were created and placed in an orderly environment so that no individual can claim possession of the earth, and no one is allowed to sell a piece of land beyond reclaim because the world belongs to God. And so humanity only acts as the keeper of this precious gift. So B, God acting on the world, God in history. God's might and concern is revealed through historical events, such as the Exodus being the work of God, in Exodus 22, 20, verse 2, and Deuteronomy 26, 8 through 9. Oh. Uh, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. That's Exodus 20, verse 2. Then in Deuteronomy, the Lord freed us from Egypt by a mighty hand. He brought us to this place and gave us this land. Um, God controls the affairs of the Israelites and those who come in contact with the Israelites. Deuteronomy 7, the Hittites, the Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations much larger than you, and the Lord your God delivers them to you, and you defeat them. Um, God punishes Israel through others. So we read in 2 Kings uh, chapter 10, verse 32, in those days, the Lord began to reduce Israel, and Hazael, king of Syria, harassed them throughout the territory of Israel. Um, also Isaiah 10, 5 through 6, Assyria, rod of my anger and against an ungodly nation, namely Israel. Um, God commissioned Cyrus to liberate Israel. So there's God um, doing a good thing for Israel through another nation. In Isaiah 44, 28, um, Cyrus shall fulfill all my God's purposes. Um, so God acts directly with the mighty hand, outstretched arm, directly with the people of Israel, or indirectly, such as using the Hittites, all these other thing, all these other places, and Cyrus. So number five, God has a special relationship with Israel. According to the Torah, God chose the people of Israel. So in Deuteronomy 7, we read, You are a people consecrated to the Lord your God. Of all the peoples on earth, the Lord your God chose you to be his treasured people. In the Song of Moses, in uh, Deuteronomy 32, we read, The Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his own allotment. He found him in a desert region in an empty howling waste. He engirded him, watched over him, guarded him, guarded him as the people of his eye. Um, so this wasn't because of any special merit of the Jewish people the, or the Israelites. 
though in Deuteronomy 7, in Deuteronomy 7, we read, It is not because you are the most numerous of peoples that the Lord has set his heart on you and chose you. Indeed, you are the smallest of peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he made to your fathers that the Lord freed you. So, according to Jewish tradition, the Jewish people were chosen because of the um, paternal and um, and the maternal. Um, oh, sorry, the patriarchs and the matriarchs' loyalty to God. Um, we read in Deuteronomy four, because he loved your fathers, he chose their offspring after them. So. This chosenness of the Jewish people doesn't give any special privileges to the Jewish people, but rather it gives them, us, more responsibilities. In Amos chapter 3 we read, You alone have I singled out of all the families of the earth. That is why I will call you to account for all your iniquities. The Israelites, the Jewish people, have a particular purpose in this world. Number one, to be light to the nations and two, to be a source of blessing to all, quote, all the families of earth shall be blessed, shall bless themselves by you. Um, but chosenness is both a source of pride and pain. Uh, this chosenness has been used as a pretext for oppression of the Jewish people. So our sages taught that Jews were only chosen after all the other peoples of the world had rejected the responsibility. And God finally came to the Jews, and the Jews said, yes, we'll take on all this responsibility. Number six, Israel has a covenant with God. What is a covenant? A covenant is a contract. So God extends covenants to several individuals in the Bible, to Noah, to Abraham, to David. But at Sinai, there was a special covenant, a barit, with the entire Jewish people, the entire people of Israel. Not only the direct generation, of Israel that were sitting there, or not sitting here, that were there at Sinai, but with all the generations yet to come. We read in Deuteronomy 29, I make this covenant with its sanctions, not with you alone, but both with those who are standing here with, this, with us this day before the Lord our God, and with those who are not with us here this day. What does this covenant do? It imposes duties and obligations upon both God and the Israelites. Um, upon God, um, it imposes that God should protect Israel. Upon Israel, God, uh, Israel must be loyal to God and true to the covenant. So in Deuteronomy 28, 1, we read, Now if you obey the Lord your God to observe faithfully all his commandments, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Um, if you fail... In Jeremiah chapter 11, we read, They have returned to the iniquities of their fathers of old. They too have followed other gods and served them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken the covenant which I made with their fathers. Assuredly, thus said the Lord, I am going to bring upon them disaster. But the biblical God is compassionate. A temporary backsliding won't break the bond between God and Israel. There will come a time where the obligations won't be composed from the outside, but will be in, inscribed in the heart of each Israelite, of each Jew. Each of these things will be second nature. So in Jeremiah we say, we read, Jeremiah 31, See, a time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my teaching into their inmost being and inscribe it upon their hearts. Then I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the Torah will just be second nature to the Jewish people. They won't have to keep reading and learning the laws over and over again. They'll just, we'll just do it because we do it. Uh, number seven, God also requires ethical behavior. The biblical God is a source of ethical values. The rituals are not enough. We read in Hosea 6, For I desire goodness, not sacrifice, obedience to God rather than burnt offering. So here there are all the things of the covenant, but here it's showing that God doesn't want the sacrifices of the covenant. God wants goodness, not sacrifice, obedience, not just the burnt offerings. So God says, just as I am holy, so shall you be holy, in Leviticus 19. 
So what is God's requirement? In Micah we read, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what the Lord requires of you, only to do justice, and to love goodness, and to walk modestly with your God. And that is in Micah chapter 6. God is a personal God. This is number 8. These human traits that have been applied to God are ascribed to God. God is not made, oh, there were human traits of, uh, ascribed to God, but God is not made of flesh and blood. We read in Hosea, I am God, not man. But God embodied all of the highest human qualities. God, both, God is both far away a supreme power, a far away supreme power, and an approachable and caring deity. The biblical... Israelites, the biblical Jews, pictured God like a parent. In Psalm 103, we read, As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear, meaning revere, him. Sometimes God quotes, gets, quote, jealous. Um, God displays, quote, anger at Israel. But God's, quote, steadfast love towards them endures forever. So these are all human qualities, highest human qualities being applied to God. God is, quote, a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, renouncing pun punishment, end quote. And that's from Jonah. Um, if an Israelite is in trouble, um, they can approach God. The Lord is near to all who call him, to all who call him with sincerity. Number nine. We can't understand why the righteous suffer. That's what the Bible says. Their major assumption in the Bible is that God punishes the wicked and rewards the righteous, which we can see in Proverbs chapter 10. The righteous can look forward to joy, but the hope of the wicked is doomed. In Psalms we read, I have been young and I am now old, but I have never seen a righteous man abandoned or his children seeking bread. But the Israelites complain that this is not always the case. How can a good God allow this to happen? How can the good God allow the righteous to suffer? Well, in Abraham, we read, he said, that far be it from you to do such a thing, to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty, so that innocent and guilty fare alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Then in Jeremiah, we read, how does the way of the wicked prosper? That's in chapter 12. The prophet Habakkuk asked God, You whose eyes are too pure to look upon evil, who cannot countenance wrongdoing, why do you countenance treachery and stand by idle while the one in the wrong devours the one in the right? So here's the wicked uh, getting better things than the righteous. Then in Psalms we read, in Psalm 73, I saw the wicked at ease. So the answers throughout the Bible of why the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper are not always uniform. Um, Eliphaz in Job maintained that suffering is deserved punishment for sin or transgression. So we read in Job 4, As I have seen those who plow evil and sow mischief reap them. But in Deuteronomy we read that suffering is only a test. Remember the long way, oh, this is Deuteronomy 8. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has made you travel in the wilderness these past 40 years, that he might test you by hardships to learn what was in your hearts, whether you would keep his commandments or not. There are some who say that, hey, it, it just happens. The righteous suffer and the wicked uh, prosper. That's just the way it is. In Ecclesiastes, that is the sad thing about all that goes on under the sun, that the same fate is in store for all. Um, Isaiah and Zophar say, nay, it's beyond our comprehension. So Isaiah and Isaiah and Zophar and Job. Isaiah 55, as the heavens are high above the ways, so are my, my ways high above your ways. So we don't know what God's doing. God does it because it's God. In Job, would you discover the mystery of God? Would you discover the limit of Almighty? But regardless, we can return to God for strength. We read in Psalms, I applied myself to understand this, but it seemed a hopeless task till I entered God's sanctuary and reflected on their fate. And that is Psalm 73. So, to summarize, 
God in the Bible. There are many points of contact between the Bible and the ancient Near Eastern texts about God. Israel's biblical God incorporates a number of characteristics attributed to various other gods, but Israel's God surpasses them. Rather than being part of a divine assembly, Israel's God acts alone. Rejecting the custom prevalent among other nations, the Bible prohibits the making of sculptured images of God. The gods of other nature, nations acted within the cycle of nature and often were indistinguishable from them. There were separate gods for weather, rain, the sun, the moon, etc. In Israel, God stands outside of this cycle and is not identified with it. Quote, It is I, the Lord, who made everything declares Isaiah chapter 44 on behalf of God. Israel's God puts a heavy emphasis on ethical behavior. God has established a special covenant with Israel and yet is also the only savior of humanity. We read in Isaiah 45, turn to me and gain success all the ends of the earth. And that was the summary straight, taken straight after out of this book, Finding God, 10 Jewish Responses, by Rifat Sonsino and Daniel B. Syme. Um, so the next chapter, chapter 2, is God and Rabbinic Literature. Thank you for joining me for this um, lesson. I'm sorry it wasn't taped or recorded live in the class at the synagogue, um, but the rest of them should be. If you have any questions, you can send me an email through the synagogue website, and they'll forward it to me, or you can send me a tweet to that, at L. Falk, and I will get back to you as quickly as I can. Um, I'm recording this right before Thanksgiving and Hanukkah, so happy Thanksgiving uh, 2013, and um, happy Hanukkah, or Thanksgivingka, and we will see you next time. Shalom.